ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, welcome one, welcome all to a very special edition. Uh, this is not actually the Sin Shop live stream, which, by the way, you could see every Monday and Friday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time at twitch.tv forward slash Sin Shop. Uh, but I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and with me tonight, I've got Dr. Popular, Blaze, and Thomas Tusano. And tonight, we are, well, today, we are going to be talking about uh, the, uh, the grind culture. What is it? Why is it? What are we doing? What the heck? I mean, come on. So anyway, uh, so first of all, uh, let's let's do some uh, some introductioning here. Dr. Popular, take us away. Uh, howdy, my name is Dr. Popular. I live in San Francisco. Uh, I am a game uh, publisher. Made a game called Knife Tank: The Shuffling and a few other Knife Tank related games. Uh, I also make yo-yos and videos, and all of that kind of ties in with day job stuff I do. So I have a day job on top of all that where I get to make comics and i jokingly sent you an animated gif and i'm so happy that you decided to include it in there so yes of course i would but that just made my day uh well you know what i'm here to help all right blaze what do we got we got yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself yeah my name's uh blaze currently the director of technology at spoke uh, we do internet of things for industrial machines um and in the background i'm just playing around with digital mufflers for teslas and launching miniature death stars into space with working lasers, uh, previous experience also in like AR and VR in previous startups where I, where I was uh, CTO there at Space VR. But right now, just having fun. Um, and I started my career at NASA for the first couple of years, and that'll probably be something we bring up near the end of the conversation. Uh, awesome. So Very cool. All fun. right. Thomas, what do we got? Well, you all know me. Uh, I'm a woodworker and vocational educator. I uh, used to be involved in the tabletop industry and now working on promoting artists and uh, educating people on how to do different vocational skills. Awesome. And uh, I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, a host and uh, uh, operator and head custodian of the Sin Shop podcast, uh, which you can catch every Monday and Friday night. Uh, and that's, again, that's at 730 twitch.tv forward slash Sin Shop. Uh, we are uh, representing the, the uh, Sin Shop, the makerspace in Las Vegas, Nevada, with the tools and equipment that you can use to make pretty much whatever you can think of. So uh, you can check out more about the shop at sinshop.org, uh, but let's just go ahead and, and get right into it. Uh, you know, making, a, uh, making a, a live stream is a lot of work, but I enjoy it. But there are people out there that, are, that have, have taken the hustle culture thing and they've gone so far with it that there's no possible way that it could still be enjoyable. Like, have you, have, so let's, I guess let's start there. Does the hustle thing, or, so let's see, let's go through the panel. Do you hustle? Would you consider yourself a hustler? Do you grind? Are you a grinder? Can I find you? <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> right now, I would say I don't grind uh like to have fun outside of the day job but um, i'm all about work-life balance really so um. absolutely all right thomas how about you um i would say yeah i've i've burnt out quite a few times on different things um and i mean i'm still just i'm just learning my lesson uh i think that there's a way to make uh, a passion a career but it's a very precarious balancing act Absolutely. All right, Doc, what do you think? Yeah, I'm all about the uh, the work-life balance as well. I try to uh, re-energize myself by working on creative projects at home. So uh, yeah, I try not to burn out at home or at work and seems to be kind of just the right level for me. So when you say the right level, how do you, how do you know when it's time to switch, when it's time to switch something up? I'm, I'm a pretty hardcore, like for, for my day job, I'm pretty hardcore into that nine to five kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, it used to be a little easier when I had the office, you know, I'm working from home now. So it is a little harder to kind of switch from like working on art for work and working on art for myself when I'm using the same, you know, chair, space, uh, computer and everything. Uh, it used to be so much easier. You just like, well, the, the stuff happens at work and then it just kind of stays in that office and I come home. But um, I guess I just have some good practice uh, of being able to kind of switch that brain off at five and uh, start working on my own stuff. Yeah, there's there's no way I could have survived the past year if I hadn't gotten a uh, a, a Herman Miller air on from my former employer. So, you know, <laughs> thank you to my former boss for letting this walk out the door. But at any rate, 
<laughs> uh, so uh, what, what about you, Blaze? Time tracking. Yeah, time tracking using Harvest. And I found a new command line time tracker that I might try out. But just knowing what you're doing at any instance kind of makes me feel more empowered and at ease. So do you track time at wasting oh. time? No, sorry. Go ahead. Finish your uh, yeah, you can see where you're wasting time, where you're goofing off, where you think you're most productive during a day. That's why I like to wake up early. Absolutely. So, so do you find that that so do you track home stuff that you do, or do you also time do you time track uh, just work stuff for work's sake, or do you time track like projects that you do? Uh, time track everything inside of Asana with the Harvest uh, integration. Like my entire life is broken down. Dang. If I don't write something down, I won't do it. So. Yeah. So do you go back and look at like your, your, your stats, you know, like I've worked on this project for X number of hours. I've done this for this long. Yep. Uh, Harvest has a nice like reporting system where you can like output what you did each week. And uh, I can see all the past due dates and Asana, like stuff turns red yeah. for stuff that's late. So yeah, that's pretty awesome. How, how about you, Thomas? Um, I actually have a really great tool for keeping track of, of what I'm up to. Um, uh, first is the <laughs> my Etsy orders, seeing when they're due and knowing like when they need to ship. Um, and the second thing is a book called A Clever Fox. Uh, and so it's basically a, a planner and you write down like what your overarching goals, like career goals or whatever else is. Um, and then I break down further into daily note cards by writing lists on them. And I'll often complete a task, check it off, take a little while, 30 minutes to an hour to do something fun. And then I'll go back and I'll do another task to keep from like completely wearing myself down by the, by the end of the day. Hmm. So, uh, in the chat, uh, Blaze, somebody asked, uh, what that command line, ch uh, time tracker was, uh, I'd have to turn on signal. My roommate sent it to me. I can get it to you here in a second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just send that to me in the chat and I'll, I'll throw it in our, uh, uh in, in the, uh, you, Pong? sounds like you kind of wing it day to day or. <laughs> so my time tracking is, is, is very basic. My time tracking is the giant orb in the sky. Uh, when it goes down, uh, actually before it goes down, like a few hours before that I stop doing work for, for money. And then I start working on other stuff, you know, like, you know, stuff for the show and you know, all that stuff. Uh, so honestly, like I've got, I've got, you know, the time I need to go to bed to be a human in the morning. And I've got the, uh, you know, I've got to, you know, make dinner and all that stuff, you know, take time for, for home life. But other than that, I'm, I'm working on stuff a lot, like, especially this past week, actually, especially this past month, uh, we, we do, uh, 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 local robot fights, basically like the equivalent of a regional, uh, robot battle, the kind of the equivalent of a regional battle bots. And we, uh, oh, Hey, thank you. Thank you. Law. Thanks for dropping by. Uh, we do, uh, basically that. So we've been working on that on our live streams for, for a little bit. Uh, but at any rate, so yeah, uh, we'll get that in the, uh, in the chat for you that, that time tracker, uh, once, uh, once it comes through and, uh, but yeah. So do you find that having that, uh, so, I mean, it sounds to me like out of the four of us, I'm probably the most unhealthy here. Cause I just like, I just take all the available time and fill it up with, with what I'm doing now. I, I like Thomas. my naps, so I, I schedule my naps too. So you schedule your nap. That yeah. that that is a level of organization that I do not possess. Yeah, awesome. So yeah. so has that been working for you? Like, have you found yourself getting burned out? I guess we'll start we'll start Doc Pop and, and work our way down to to Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't know about burned out. For me, it is um, trying to finish projects. That's always the the tough part. Um, I do tend to have too many things going. Uh, burning out isn't super hard for me, but I think part of that is because I've always uh, very quickly quit something if it's really stressing me out, you know, like put it on the back burner, and, which again, makes it hard to kind of finish things. So there are times that I'll just be like, look, I need to get this on Kickstarter. Um, I'm just going to, no matter what, spend the next month only working on this, no matter how stressful it is. Uh, mm -hmm. But like when I do those things, it's usually just like a month or two uh, and then I can go back to just kind of my normal thing. And I think the thing that's kept me from burning out, like in all of my careers and kind of hobbies has just been the, the fact that I can switch. Like I, I'm not a full-time yo-yo -er or a full-time game designer. So like, if I stop working on a game tomorrow, like I'm not going to get fired. Uh, I can, you know, I can work on an album or something. And that's, that's just been the, the, the thing I feel super lucky about is that I can always just switch. 
yeah, that that was the kind of the thing behind uh, the the title of the show. You know, don't quit your day job. Having that additional income is just ridiculously helpful. Uh, Blaze, what about you? Has has that been working for you to keep you from from getting burned out, or do you feel like you know you're being pulled in every direction at the same time? How's that working for you? Uh, no, I don't think it's actually worked. Every two or three years, I do kind of get burnt out. Uh, deal with depression as well, so that probably doesn't help the situation, but. I try to be organized so that other people don't put too much pressure on me. And that doesn't always quite seem to work, but, uh, yeah, from time to time, I'll just take a break and do nothing for two months straight. Wow. That, oh, that, that sounds wonderful. I have a feeling that's where I'm going to be at after the next robot fight. Like, like, cause I'll be, I'll finally be like, Oh God, I don't have to set anything up. But, uh, so Thomas, how about you? How's, how's your burnout uh, treating you? Oh man. So I find that I will want, I, it's an increasing interval where I'm going longer between burnout stretches. And I take that as either an increase in resilience and what I'm able to take or in um, just, I'm, I'm honing in on what I love more and more. <clears throat> so every, like at first I did my first stretch, I got burned out after two, three months. My next stretch, it took me a year and a half. My next stretch, it took me two years before I, I hit that wall again. And so now I'm kind of finding like, okay, am I getting better at handling it? Am I loving what I'm doing more? Or so what, and that's kind of where I'm I'm at right now. And it's probably something to unpack with a, with a therapist, but that's <laughs> my mindset on it. Like my mindset is stretch out, do both increase the strength you have to resist burnout and the, the mechanisms you use to avoid it as well as figure out how to hone in on exactly what aspect of it you love and the discipline to continue doing it. Do you think you're doing more group projects or more solo projects as time goes along? I'm uh, more collaborative projects. Like there are certain things that I want to do with specific people um, and that I get really excited about. Uh, and then, there's more um, a community, like a more show of support. And, then, and the more I lean into it, um, I think the more my friends kind of see the, the true self, the craftsman I identify as, and they get really hype about that. And that gets me really hype. And then it's like, okay, I have to do this thing because there's so much hype and excitement about it and around it. Uh, and that's, that's what I've been leaning into to avoid burning out like a lot. So nice. Do you find that, that relying on others has a lot there there have been times in the past where where i've worked with others on something and they wanted to go in this direction and i wanted to go in this direction and it just ended up being such a struggle do you find that very often or do you find that that's something that's easily able to be over overcame overcome you for something you're able for, to overcome easily there you go all right um i i eliminate that by by method of, and I've experienced this most with Woody, who will be on the next panel. Um, I eliminate that by being direct and honest with expectations. Like I set the expectations. If the expectations don't match up, then we find a compromise and, and figure it out instead of, or if, if we can't, and it's like, hey man, I don't have, don't really have time for the project right now. Can we circle back to this later? Uh, and by being that honest instead of, because I used to just be like, go along with, whatever but by being honest from the jump being transparent with what the expectations for the project are i know me and me and you pong have had a couple of those conversations about the show about doing a sin shop collabs and whatever mm -hmm. else yeah so you've kind of seen that process from the interior um but just transparent with expectations and then saying like yes this works no it doesn't and being honest with another eliminates that confusion and putting that effort into a project that ultimately doesn't come to fruition Absolutely. Uh, Law in the chat says collaboration is phenomenal when communication is clear and goals are aligned. I could not possibly agree with that more. I mean, and that's, that's another thing too. Oh, oh sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to get away from this before, before doc has a chance to answer. How about, how about yourself? Um, every time I've uh, partnered up with someone, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time and it ended up causing a lot of stress later. Um, there are interesting ways I found to partner with people. Like, um, if someone else is working on a project, that's not a joint project, we can collaboratively get together and like push each other. And like, you know, uh, I bet I, I bet I'm going to get the Kickstarter before you or whatever, like kind of have like playful milestones and stuff like that works great for me. 
but um, collaborating with other folks, I found every time I end up really getting caught up emotionally in like a small change they made and that sort of stuff will burn me out. Right. Yeah. Like uh, just like seeing that, like, Oh, I thought we were totally on the same page. And then after like weeks of meetings, they say something you're like, we are totally in a different spot. I do like collaborating with like my fans and stuff. Uh -huh. um, like the, the people who like support my art and like are into what I'm doing, like they're great resources and I, and they oftentimes want to get involved and I keep forgetting to involve them in things. I keep thinking I just make things for them rather than with them. Yeah. But partnering up with someone, especially when money's involved for me has, it just turns out I'm not built for that. I keep, I keep thinking it's going to work out and it never has. See, that's, and that's, a, that's something that I've actually, I've actually dealt with quite recently is, you know, if you don't set the, the expectations at the ground level before there's money on the table, you're just inviting heartache. Cause if it's like, oh, well, we'll figure out, figure it out when we start making money. No, 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 no. That is, that is a terrible, terrible idea. Oh, uh, uh, Blaze, send that to me and I'll throw it up in the chat. Um, so uh, do you guys, well, I don't know if you, if you want to slash can share any stories about uh, when, when money discussions went wrong, but I, maybe a better way to put that is, uh, uh, like in general terms, like what, have you had those situations happen to you in the past? I guess I'm not trying to call anybody out here. Um, yeah, definitely a couple aerospace startups ago raised over a million dollars and felt like we might've wasted it on stuff. So it's always good to get a, a joint bank account, uh, cause a startup is pretty much a marriage anyway. So. Just so you can kind of track everything going back and forth, I would recommend that. <laughs> awesome, yeah, no, def definitely, uh, uh, Thomas. It's uh, up to you if you if you, you you guys can totally pass on this if you want to. You don't have anything that you can't. Um, uh, I've had I've had a couple people that I've wanted to bring into the fold with Tusano that um, definitely um i've had to back away from in the past people who um i thought initially were really good creatives that i then had to be like i don't know and i had to kind of back away slowly um so i'm very guarded about who i collab with now mm -hmm. uh when bringing them into making like tusano products and stuff like that and i make sure that i've known these people for like six months to a year at the least and i've gotten a true sense of their character because it's not Tusano is not just me. Like I'm the face man. I'm Thomas Tusano. Like my name is on the door and whatever else. But there's my artists. There's Wicked. There's Tay. There's oh, photographers. There's my sister Leanne, and I'm representing them as well as myself. And I need to continuously think about what that brand image looks like. Um, and that's the reason why I like. If my name is, that's why the company is my name is because if I don't personally endorse it, it's my name's not on it. So, yeah. Yeah. How, how do you feel on that? On that doc? I mean, that's the, all, all, everything that you have out there in the world, you go to drpopular.com, you know, it's, you know, doc pop, the dot band or drpopular.bandcamp, like all the things you're Dr. Popular. So, so do you feel that that kind of carries over there too? Um, in terms of having my name on stuff, yeah, uh, the, the, I haven't had issues with collaborating. Like when I collaborate with people, it's usually not under my name. And the, the issue I do have with collaborating is, is not fiscal. It's usually ownership. Uh, like we're both on the same page for like six months working on a project. And then six months or a year later, when it's time to do another, like a sequel to that project or whatever, and somebody can't do it, but then you're like, well, crap, like who owns this? What do we do with this? That's That's the sort of stuff for my projects that collaboration usually ends up becoming a bit of a pain. It's great when everyone's on the same page for like that immediate time. Yeah. But later it's like, Oh, like you can't make, you're making another one of those things. You can't do that. Like I didn't have anything to do with that or whatever. Like that's, right. that's the awkward stuff that I don't like. Yeah. See, that's the other stuff you have to sort out at the beginning too. It's not just the money. It's, you know, who has basically a uh, uh, parental control or, or, you know what I mean? Like who has a, uh... Oh, what is that? What's that called? Custody. Yeah. Who has custody after, after it's all said and done? Cause I mean, in a way, you know, these are kind of our, our, our little baby ideas that we are sending off into the world. But you know, at some point, uh, so, let's see, it sounds like all of you guys, this issue says Gorgies, uh, it could be solved by legal documentation. I want to come back to that. That's an interesting thing. Uh, but I wanted to, to, uh, rewind just a little bit here. 
and uh, and say, uh, Miss Jackalope, one of our mods, by the way, and thank you so much for it. I see her out there battling the bots. Just boom, 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 boom. Thank you so much. Um, uh, but she says, uh, one thing I'm kind of guilty <laughs> doing to avoid burnout is remembering that it's okay to say no. Sorry, Pong. No problem. You can say no. Not a problem. And I mean, you know, like if someone's if someone's in a state where they're like, no, I can't. I can't even. I'm out of spoons. Totally cool. Like, you know, not a problem. Uh, but and 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 you know, it, it's great though that you are able to actually join us and give us your perspective because you know that's that's definitely uh, definitely something that uh, that we love to have. Uh, Jim says building trust and respect takes time. Different levels of friendships and working relationships, acquaintances, casual friends, close friends, etc. Yeah, oh, it absolutely does. Um, yeah. So so Thomas, earlier you said uh, that you like to work for people with people, or you like to know people for six months to a year before you actually go into business? Yeah, well, that's that's before I go into business, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily collaborating with them. Like I know I knew gray noise for like a couple weeks tops. Like I reached out to you guys out of the blue. Yeah. Um, but I did get to know you guys over a couple months, like before the show. Um, now when I talk, when I say business, I mean things like my merch, my shirts, my stuff like that, that I'm doing, yeah. um, you know, and yeah, like, uh, I have, one of the panel guests that are coming up, I worked with Woody or Chris Locke of Lockwood Designs and Guitars or Guitar and Design, either way. Um, I knew him as a coworker for about a year and a half. And then after he left and after I left, I approached him and I was like, hey, we both do woodwork. We're not competing with each other. Do you want to collaborate in a way that boosts both of our brands? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I had a good sense of who Woody is as a worker, who, you know, what can I expect when I go into the shop? Um, how does his mind work? And we also organized my garage, which gave me a sense of working with him directly with no other oversight. Um, and so after all that, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, Woody seems like a really good fit. And then I introduced him to Leanne, who is my other kind of creative decision maker for Tusano. And she's like, yeah, this is obviously like a really great thing. I, I like X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z idea he brings to the table. Mm -hmm. Let's work with him. And that was kind of the process is like, it's not, it's, it's testing the culture fit as well as the, and the work methods and the, the mindset and the reasoning why, and making sure that it all lines up. That's, that's the difficulty. So mm -hmm. someone can have a really great idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a great organizer or logistical planner for that same idea. They could just be the idea person. So. Yeah, Blaze, how about you? How long do you usually go before you'll before you'll invite someone in to work on a thing? Or is it just pretty much like Yeah, I like the dating analogy still. I usually wait at least a year before like signing like uh LLC paperwork with anyone. Getting that legal documentation in, I feel like is pretty important though. Even if it's like a half page contract, I'll never want to produce like a six page legalese thing that no one's ever gonna read, but one paragraph is good enough for me. Awesome. I do like to know the person for yeah. at least a year. So, Doc, I, I, did we skip you on the on the uh, okay to say no? I think we did. Oh, we just uh, someone in the chat, you know, brought it up, and I just wanted yeah. to point out that that's a, a really good thing. Learning to say no is a superpower, and it's super hard to do when you're trying to start your career. Yeah. Um, that being said, the stress that can be caused if you really can't do something. And all you're thinking about is this project you owe someone that you kind of know you don't have time to do or you're just not interested in doing but you said yes because you're worried about like not having that opportunity again why well, i mean aside from that stress that you can avoid it is super important to always deliver like as as an artist i only work with artists who have delivered and if they've if they've screwed me over this is pg-13 so i'm going to use up our one cuss word if they fucked me over uh i am just, <laughs> I am just never going to hire them again. I'm never going to recommend them again. Like it's, it's not like, it, it's not even that they did me wrong. It's just that I'm not going to go through that process again. So like, yeah, anytime you are working with someone, uh, and they say yes, and they drop the ball, it's much worse than if they just said no from the start. And that's a thing I think I've done too. I think I've lost opportunities because I said yes. And then kind of ghosted. Yep. Done the same thing. Yeah. So, so what, tell, what, what about that, Blaze? Like, do you want to go into that? 
I, I, we'll yeah. get to I keep saying that yeah. that is the best way to do it, but yeah. I have made those mistakes in the past. So it's good to just be honest as much as possible in life. Having yeah. to remember your lies is super challenging. It's super hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just a lot more. It's a lot easier just to just to tell the truth in the first place. I think in in so I DJed for probably 15 years total and I missed one flight. I missed one gig and that's because I fell asleep at the gate. It's the only gig that I have ever missed the entire career and I was crushed. I was like, "Oh no, I had I was batting a thousand and yeah, but anyway. All right, Thomas, what do you got? Um I I just want to say that to the young creatives out there, anyone who hasn't learned this lesson yet, learning not to say no like or learning just to say yes to everything or however we want to phrase it without setting boundaries it will crush you mm. and i will admit tusano has come to a full standstill before because i have said yes too many times i'll full i'll fully own that there are people who didn't get their stuff because i said yes too many times because i was saying yes to a project that i thought would get me more reach or more clout or whatever you want to tell like whatever it is and I have said yes to things and then gotten buried by them and then went into analysis paralysis about it. Mm -hmm. um, learn to set your boundaries now because you could end up, as Doc Pop was saying, trapped in a project that you re you're really not passionate about or that you said yes to that is then binding you from taking other greater opportunities. Yeah. Learn to set boundaries. It's so important. Well, you say yes a lot, but I also like to like put an hourly limit on it too. So that kind of helps me control some of my stress level, even if I'm saying yes too much. It's like, yes, but three hours per week kind of thing. Fair That's enough. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Miss Jack Love also says analysis paralysis is a real thing too. Arg. Yes, it, it definitely is. So, so do you, do you guys find yourself doing that? We'll start with, uh, with doc this time. Uh, do you find yourself doing that? Like, like, getting yourself stuck in analysis paralysis and like, oh man, if I take this job, oh, but there's gonna be too much time here. And, and you know, he doesn't even know how to do a panel. He just thinks two people makes a panel. That's ridiculous. You know, like, like, have you had, have you had anything like that happen recently? I, I can't think of situations like that. Maybe I've managed to avoid that. Um, maybe when the other panelists speak, maybe I'll, I'll remember something, but this doesn't sound like an experience I've had, had to do with. Oh, where you where you weren't able to to decide at the very beginning, like to say no or to say oh, yes. Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you now. Uh, yeah, that that happens all the time, and that's almost always caused me to say yes, and then end up not shipping or shipping at way too much labor than I expected it to. Yeah, those are those are the ones where, in, in retrospect, it's always easy to be like, I should have said no to this. But yeah, th I mean, that can still happen to anyone, no matter what your intentions are, and even if you think you can do something, you get excited about working with a creator you like or something. Yeah, the, it's hard to be able to know from the beginning exactly what you're going to be like in like a month when you're working on the project. Oh, man, that's true, especially with this thing. But yeah, because this was originally supposed to be uh, this panel was supposed to be about the path forward out of the pandemic and all that stuff. And then <laughs> so optimistic. Yeah, you know, we were we were young and foolish three months ago. So, you know, <laughs> so quick change of plans there. All right. So, Blaze, from what I understand, uh, your face just said volumes just a second ago. So, uh, I think that was the arg. Oh, oh, gotcha. Over uh, analysis, do you do do you has it? Uh definitely not. People yell at me for making decisions too quickly most of the time. I'm more of the SpaceX Starship, blow it up quickly, fix the problems later. Because it's always hard to get started on a project. Um, so then I'll work with people that are better at refining stuff. But I just like to get going and document it all in Asana with due dates, but uh, yeah, wow. I have no paralysis when it comes to stuff like that. Oh, all right. So uh, Thomas, how about you? Um, I will say that I, the analysis paralysis for me is always about how to prevent future, like how to future proof everything. I overbuild to hell and back. Um, and so the paralysis for me will be, what is the best way to do this so that this never falls apart ever? And I need to stop doing that because it's an impossibility. There's always going to be like, I never used to use plywood in my builds. Never, ever. I was like all hardwood all the time. And then I caved because I realized that's, that's an impossibility being a woodworker. Like you're going to need to use it every once in a while. Um, 
So the paralysis for me comes in, what's the best execution for quality in the future? And I need to kind of just realize like getting this deliverable to where it is like the custom, I, I take the magic for granted. Don't take the magic for granted. The, the cust all customer sees is smoke and mirrors and what you've done and down the line, like just promise you'll fix it down the line should anything arise and have confidence in your work. And that'll take you miles. I'm not saying rip people off, right? but yeah, don't, don't get stuck in what's going to happen to this piece down the line in the future, get it out the door to where it's a quality to where the customer is going to be wowed or the commissioner is going to be wowed or the collaborator is going to appreciate what you've done. Um, don't let future proofing stop it being good now. So it sounds to me like that that's kind of a, uh, um, advocating the sloppy first copy the basically, you know, get this thing out the door and then, and then see how it fails and then fix it. Yeah. And, and I've also like, I've hedged that bet with Tusano by saying like, Hey, for the life of this thing, if you need any, you know, reach out to me because I'll share everything I've learned about the process in a word vomit email to tell you every little thing that could go wrong or that I thought of during the process, which is a major liability and flaw that someone's going to want to gag me for later. Like the engineers in the room are going, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this engineer agrees. Yeah. So, but but when we're talking about cutting boards and furniture, it's not someone's life at stake. So you can kind of, you can be a little bit more fast and loose with that. So that's what I do is I, I stand behind everything I've done, I've done and say, Hey, if anything ever happens, contact me, I'll fix it. You know? See, I come, I come from the, uh, from the data center world where our backups of our backups have backups. And if they don't, you're, you, you need a backup. Uh, so then, uh, yeah. So, so to me, that's a little bit like, what? Like, you know, the, the video <laughs> stuff that I've been designing, like, you know, okay, but what if someone kicks the cord out? I got to make sure it can stand that. Okay. What if the, what if the, the, uh, uh, Wi-Fi goes down, I won't be able to use the Wi-Fi. So what about that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like taking all these little what ifs, because as soon as you don't do one of those, it's going to happen. You know, that's, that's, that's just what's going to happen. Um, I, before we, oh, I did want to, well, here, before I move on to the chat, uh, doc pop, uh, any thoughts on that? Anything come up while they were talking? Well, yeah, uh, Thomas was talking about um, not letting things hold you back from getting something out the door, which is uh, another skill that people might have trouble learning. Some some people, it seems, could just kind of crank out stuff super quickly and not have an issue with it. I think it's a real skill for me to know, like, this is, this is good enough, get it out. And I think that uh, one of the things that could be very important for an artist or a maker is making a lot of stuff because you never know what's going to catch on and yeah. it's never it's i want to say never ever it's rarely the thing you think is going to be the thing that catches on it's rarely the thing you spent you know a thousand hours on that you can't wait to show the world it's oftentimes the thing you made on a back of a napkin you know while <laughs> while you were drinking coffee taking breaks from that long project so just make a lot of things and don't get invested too much in one thing uh, you want to ship good stuff, but it doesn't need to be uh, as good as you might think. It's oftentimes it's ready. And the only thing keeping you from putting it out isn't the quality. It's just, you know, you're emotionally hung up on it and you need to just ship it and start making the next thing. Yeah, you got to read the first the sentence on your website about one feature and everything else is kind of below that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing I found that, that that's um, just awesome working with the, uh, uh, working with the people at uh, at BattleBots and and you know on some of the teams and all that uh, is just the that ethos is just baked into the crust on as far as uh, as far as the robot combat stuff like they build stuff specifically they know it's going to get destroyed they build it to see and and, and actually run it to see how it gets destroyed like every time every failure is a success every failure is a way to find out more uh, you know, of, of what they need, you know, what, how they need to rebuild it next time to come back and, and be better and win. Okay. So I'm the chat's just running away from me here. Okay. So, uh, Jim, says, sorry. Oh, no, no, you're fine. Jim says, I have difficulties knowing how much to charge for products. Uh, I don't do physical products, uh, intellectual co property kind. Uh, I've done various projects and charge various prices. Negotiating is a challenge for me. That's why having someone like Thomas as a go-between negotiator really helps. 
Uh, Helene says, uh, one of my biggest enemies, I'm guessing that was, oh, letting friends ruin business, I think it was. Uh, let's see, over analysis can make you, oh, uh, Thomas says, well, you're, you're here. I'm yeah. Gonna read, I'm going to read your chat. <laughs> uh, over analysis can make you very knowledgeable about a thing you have no idea how to do, says Helene. Uh, do, 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 do. Law says, give yourself time to step back, step away, and catch a breath. Very important. Uh, yeah, Jim says, minimum viable product, knowing what, uh, when it's when to say it's ready. Agree with Doc. Uh, Jack Lope says, uh, totes agree. Try all the prototypes, send them out in the world, see what happens. Law says, finished is better than perfect. That's nice. I'm definitely going to steal that one. Um, uh, Jack Lope has three Etsy stores and a merch store. And uh, what Thomas just said, Waves. Okay. All right. Yes. Never take the magic for granted. Um, so that was a thing that I that I had to learn early in, in in my in my DJing career, and this is this is was part of my like I had like a standard package of advice to give to younger aspiring DJs, and that was one of them. Never say you made a mistake. Okay, here's here's what I say. Here's what I, here's what I mean by that. If someone comes up to you and is like, "Man, that was a great set," or if someone comes up to you and says, "You know, for for the people watching, man, that was a great comic you made." or that was a great story, or that was a great uh, uh, video you put up on YouTube, that was great. Do not, under any circumstances, point out the flaws. Because oh, you're doing two that. things wrong here, and it's and one of them might not be what you think. The first thing that you're doing, obviously, is you're pointing out the flaws. But what you're also doing is you're telling that person that just came up and told you, uh, you know, told you how much they think you're great and how much they like your art, they like what you do, you're telling them that they're wrong. True. You're telling you're telling this person that loves you, that respects your opinion, that they are incorrect. Don't ever, ever, ever do that. Always, if, if, and if you're if you're in that point where you're like, oh, my set sucked, and someone's like, man, that was so great, you'd be like, hey, I had a great time playing for you guys. You don't have to say anything about that. But yeah, that's that would be my you know if I was going to give some advice to. Uh, to someone that that was starting out in that or in anything where you're putting your work out into the public if, if you take away you know that, that would be my thing that I hope you take away from the, the words coming out of my mouth uh doc what about you time? is there any time to say that you made a mistake though oh uh I would to, to someone to in to private? another DJ yes or to another person in the field yeah that's fine you know because they already know you know if you if you had to like, you know, and Jackalope knows about this, I'm sure. If you have to like sneak out of a mix real quick, you know, like, you know, like, and then and then you leave the mix, you know, if you have to do that, other DJs are gonna know. But if you do it really well, sometimes it works. You know, you just pump your fist three times and then and then you know wave your arms and then and, and you're good. But um, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying about um, you know, if if a fan comes up and says something nice. Uh, it's hard sometimes not to be like, oh, now that was terrible or whatever mm -hmm. you should have, like, it's, it's super hard to do. And you sort of feel lame sometimes doing that, like you're big headed or something, but it's actually, I mean, just agreeing with them is the nicest thing you can do to them. It's yes. way cooler than, you know, trying to be cool. Uh, but, but this all kind of reminds me of, you know, a big part of being an artist is actually client management uh, and dealing with clients on commissions. You know, Thomas, I'm sure you probably have a lot of, times where you're, you're half your job is just dealing with the client and a lot of sales experience stuff can kind of help artists with that. And we don't even know it. Like, um, when I bring something up to a client, if they commission something, if I go and say, ah, this is, you know, the best I could do in the time frame, or I hope you like it, that's going to set their expectations and no one's going to be happy. Like yep. they're, they're, they're not going to be stoked. Uh, it's going to cause more work for me. Cause they're going to ask for revisions and stuff. If I go to a client with something I like genuinely, and say this uh, i'm super stoked about this you're gonna love it they're gonna be stoked about it and i'm less likely to have to do some change to a color of a t-shirt or make the logo bigger or any of that stuff right um and the same like uh whenever you apologize for stuff um which is a habit uh you know i'm sorry that i didn't play a better set or i'm sorry that the crowd wasn't bigger or something that also sometimes set expectations or whatever so like we just don't we don't need to say those apologies, like, uh, unless you did something wrong, you know, like you are actually causing more of an issue for ourselves. And I think a lot of artists all suffer from this. We just want to be super humble and it's hard not to just apologize for things that are outside of our control. 
you know, USPS dropping a package or whatever, you know, instead of saying, uh, hey, I'm sorry that this package is so late, you must be super angry. Instead of that, you could say, hey, you've been super patient. I really appreciate that you've been so supportive and you've been helping me along with this. That's that's a different phrase that can save you a lot of heartache and make everyone feel like no one got screwed over, you know? Uh, so yeah, there's just weird little skills like that that can really help out help folks. Absolutely. Blaze, what do you think? Um, what was the question again? Sorry, I was reading oh, the chat. So, so it was about, uh, and, and we're definitely going to come to Law's thing here. That's going to be next. Uh, but a, a time when someone's come up to you and says, Hey man, you did a great job on this thing. Like, like I love, uh, you know, for you, this, this, this thing that you designed is really cool and it's really efficient and blah, blah, blah. But you know, in your mind, I could have done that way better. Do you tell yeah. them? I always tell them. I know I totally agree with doc though, that I shouldn't be I'm actually learning a lot today. I can see why that's really rude in lots of ways now. So I'm going to stop doing that. But yeah, I can't, I'm open source every single thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, I like talking about when I blow stuff up or stuff goes wrong, uh, but I can see why that's bad now. Well, blowing your, blowing stuff up is kind of a part of your job, isn't it? Sometimes uh, you kind of have to, it's like a controlled blowing up. Control, like it's a test program. So yeah, sometimes it is, but I also will be pretty honest about just dumb coding mistakes that I made. like. On Facebook, I posted about corrupting an SD card on a Raspberry Pi and how that messed up the project. So I should probably stop doing that. <laughs> well, it's 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 okay after the fact. You can talk about it after the fact, but you know, it's just like you know, when you hand it over to the person, you know, or you just finish doing the thing, you know, wow. then they're just like, "Oh, that was so great." Mm, yeah, I don't know. I did this one thing here, and it kind of sucked. You know, like definitely stay away from that. Thomas, what do you think? Um, so <laughs> I've had, uh, there's a thing that resonated with me in that last question with Doc Pop where he said like, oh, you know, just deliver and, and then say, you know, this is like, thank you for being super patient. I had an Etsy order that be, when the pandemic hit that got to be over 200 days old. And I woke up feeling guilty every single day. It was a large pastry board that was going to a couple towns over. It was a lady that had ordered from me based on seeing me at a local craft fair. And in the middle of the pandemic, after I finally found a way to manufacture this thing, because my shop had closed, this had closed, that had, everything was closed, I finally made it. And I like way over delivered. I delivered stickers. I delivered a second board for her, so on and so forth. And I said, thank you for being so patient in the middle of all of this craziness. I stayed in contact with it throughout the pandemic. I completely owned it. I was like, you shouldn't have to wait this long for it. But at the delivery, I like way, I just gave her like a hand signed note, uh, stickers, a second board. I said, if you enjoy your pastry board, please make sure that this gets to someone who you think would enjoy it as well. Um, Wash the and car, so on and so mow forth. the lawn. Yeah, like, yeah, pretty, pretty much. But I hand delivered it and then texted her when the package was out in her front porch. And I'm like, hey, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I over delivered for you. Here is everything, so on and so forth. And I, I sat like I, well, I made sure the customer was okay with it. But I basically sat on the bed of my truck until everything was collected to make sure it didn't get stolen, and so on and so forth. And she majorly appreciated it, and she's been a customer to this day. Absolutely. So. Yeah, some um, Amazon level customer service right there. Well, I, I hope it would be better than better, Amazon. Better, but. Better than, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Law in the chat uh, asked earlier, uh, not uh, sure if we've answered already, but when your hobby becomes your passion and that becomes your career, how do you balance the joy of it with oftentimes with with the oftentimes stress of the things that come with making it a career? I see. I see. Thomas is already. He's he's ready to go. Go ahead. Yeah, so there's two things for me that have saved my butt in this regard, and that is identity and, oh, shoot, I had the other thing. Oh, I was uh, Identity you now. and discipline. Identity and discipline, there oh, it is. Because right. um, motivation, I, I align myself with this viewpoint, even though it's very unpopular. Uh, it's Bernie Burns at VidCon, so the, what used to be the CEO of Rooster Teeth. Mm -hmm. And he said, motivation doesn't exist. Motivation, inspiration, it doesn't exist. All the, what you're talking is when those emotions line up with discipline is what you guys, is the phenomenon that you're talking about. And so he said the best way to do something is to 
make sure that you do it every day and or to discipline yourself in regards to it and keep like flexing that muscle and building it build up streaks um and he had this whole great youtube like this whole vlog about it um that i shared with law one time um and then the second aspect of it is identity and this may be borderline unhealthy you have to find a balance with this but um Do, uh, pong you know for a fact that in the in the spitballers in this little artist chat i have i'm identified by the the moniker crafter extraordinaire which is kind of a joke because i'm i'm the only 3d medium guy or was for a long time the only 3d medium guy in a room full of sketchers and illustrators and so on and so forth and so that was my that was my name because i was the only one uh, but I accepted that identity and I leaned into it and I made it so that, you know, anything, anything that didn't align with that was an attack on my integrity because I instinctively, for some reason, wanted to defend that integrity. So, and, and that namesake and, and live up to that. And so finding the balance there is a bit of a challenge, but when you have that sense of ownership that falls in with the identity and the discipline to do that thing, that is when you'll find the greatest joy in, in your success and the ability to learn from your shortcomings. Please. That's awesome. a tough one to follow, but, but go it ahead. Oh, <laughs> I was just going to say something more cliche, like delegating, like micromanaging really stresses me out. So hopefully you're working with people that you can delegate stuff to and that you trust. So that's why it's so important to know the people that you're getting into business with. So. Fair enough. Doc. I haven't figured out an answer to this question in my life. Uh, yeah. how to, you know, if, if something goes well and becomes your career, how, you know, how to kind of do it forever and not burn out on it and manage it and all that stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, no, knowing, knowing my limitations has been a, a saving grace for me there. And just knowing that like, I'm not built to own a company or, <laughs> you know, to have, uh, employees and stuff. Like, I just, I just know that. And I, you know, just work around that. Okay. So I'm going to try to tell this story real fast. Cause I do want to get to the, the thing that we would tell our 21 year old selves. Uh, but I, uh, I opened a, a record store in Kansas city and I learned that I should under no circumstances run a business. Like as far as a, a, an actual brick and mortar business under no circumstances, should I ever, ever, ever do that? Because at that point you are now showing up to a job before that DJing was just like, I show up here, I play some records. They give me some money. I pay my bills. Everything's good. You know what I mean? And, and when you keep it like on a cash base level, then it's all good. Uh, but as soon as the, as soon as it starts getting to a level where you've got to actually have an accountant, you've got to actually pay taxes and all that stuff, then, you know, that's when, that's when things get a little, little crazy. Uh, let's see, uh, let's, uh, I had a version of, uh, people's hobbies. Oh yes. People's hobbies became their jobs really quickly in the past year when folks got laid off. I almost wonder if that's what's behind the whole, you know, the great resignation, uh, you know, that that's happening now. Like, did, do you think people learned, Hey, you know what, actually. I can make a living off of Etsy or, you know, I can do this and not have to show up to my stupid job. You know, do you, do you think that that's what's behind that? Uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll go, we'll go back the other way here. Well, actually we'll start with blaze. Oh man. Uh, force <laughs> survival. Um, yeah, in a way, like if you can't, if you got fired and it's going to take a couple months to get a new day job, then just do whatever you need to do to survive. Uh, I worked at a fast food place. In the beginning of the yep. pandemic even though i'm an electrical engineer yep. um so yeah definitely i kind of feel though that having a taste of you know like because we we all had to stay at home for a little bit right and a lot of people had to go on unemployment myself included and uh, i had a job lined up it was going to start in march and then the world exploded so you know like uh and, and i'm pretty sure i'm not the uh the only person out there that has that story but um the uh, but when that happened and we're all, you know, just kind of, kind of at home and we've got our, our, our bills paid and all that stuff, uh, then, um, at that point, you know, why not open up a store or why not, you know, do something like that? So we'll let, uh, Thomas is going to have to scoot here real fast. So Thomas, do you want to have, uh, your, your final thoughts before we, uh, before you jump off to the other panel? I, yes. Um, 
I will say when it comes to this, first off, I agree on the point of the great resignation. That is part of what drove me to go part time into an industry that I thought I would be better suited for and then build Tusano up. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that no one wants a job that sucks. As my as my sister just messaged me on Facebook, Leanne, she's like, yeah, absolutely. The reason why we're doing this is because no one wants a job that sucks. Um, so there, so there's that. And she also said, listen to Pong. He's got some good advice there. Uh, so, so, um, uh, that being said, uh, parting words for everybody. Um, oh, I don't want to say do as I say and not as I do, because I mean, that's, that's the cliche thing, but I've obviously, as Pong was saying with the business, there are things that you won't be cut out for and it's okay. And that doesn't mean that you're barred from doing what you love. It means that there's another way to do what you love that you just haven't found yet. I thought that I had found my niche in the tabletop woodworking industry. And then I found it was more a dream industry. And I woke up from that and said, I have to do something if I ever want to advance. That doesn't mean that I'm barred from doing woodworking for the rest of my life. That just means that there's a different angle that which I need to approach it. Um, so never think just because you failed at one aspect or angle of, of approaching your dream and or don't feel that you're separated from the identity that you want you can still have it there's just another way to get at it so maybe maybe pong you know he's a great dj i've heard his mixes and maybe he got disenfranchised with the scene but it comes down to it now he's an excellent panel moderator he's he he loves talking to people he's still in the line of work you know and and he's still creating music and creating awesome things so uh, I'll I'll leave with the note that maybe there's a different approach to do what you love, and maybe that it, you just necessarily haven't haven't struck it yet. So and and finding a way that gels with your identity and the way you work that's that's the real goal. Awesome. All right. Well, I know you got another panel to get to, so before we kick you out, hey, thanks so much for joining us, Thomas. And uh, and uh, let's see, where 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 are they going to be able to see you in ten minutes? Don't everybody run away, but like you know, uh, if you look on um, beyond.com uh, at the at the two o'clock slot. You'll be able to see where he's headed off yep. to next. And beyond Masters of Craft panel. I'll see you all there. There it is. Peace. All right. Sounds Peace. good. See ya. All right. So a little, a little breathing room. Oh, I didn't I didn't actually make the pictures bigger, but oh well. But anyway, <laughs> so uh yeah. Uh so if we were gonna go back in time and tell ourselves something, if we're gonna go back in time to twenty one year old me, twenty one year old doc, twenty one year old Blaze. What would you say to that person? Doc, we'll go with you. We'll go with you first. Uh, I, I was super lucky that I kind of figured this out when I was 21. On my 21st birthday, I flew to Olympia, Washington, home of K Records and Kill Rock Stars and a bunch of other great uh, record labels. And I thought I was going to get signed. I was ready for a career. Um, I'd left working in radio and I was ready for a career in music as a musician. When I was there, I saw some of my favorite musicians, like in just my favorite all time musicians. And I saw that many of them were couch surfing and basically homeless and totally happy. And I realized as much as I love making art, I didn't like making art more than I liked having a place to live. Mm -hmm. And so super, super lucky the 21 year old me had this realization like I, I don't want to, I like making music, but I, I'm just going to find something else to do and make music as a hobby or whatever, because here I am, uh, 20 years later, I guess, uh, I'm making tons of music and you know, like I didn't burn out. Like I get to do whatever I want because, uh, because of the path that I, you know, chose. And sometimes I get hired to do music for games and sometimes it is still a professional thing, but just kind of realizing early on, you know, that I wasn't built to just be a full-time musician and that's okay like i can totally do this as a, as a side time thing and you know 20 years later you'll still be in love with music and you'll still be making music and it won't be that bad that's awesome so I so blaze what about how about you probably made my first big mistake at like closer to 25 I was uh working at nasa doing cool robot stuff but uh thought I could do a space rated Arduino so that kids could send stuff into space. So I'm like, peace out, NASA. The Orion capsule is going to get canceled anyway. Why am I working for the government? Startup seemed cool. SpaceX had just like launched their first rocket. Like, this is so awesome. Right. Uh, that was probably a huge mistake 
just looking back on it, probably should have stayed there for two, I don't know, five years, saved up, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars so that if you do want to kind of attack your passion a little bit later on in life, uh, you have a runway so you can pay for rent, can pay for food, because nothing makes you more unproductive than being homeless, which has happened to me twice or three times in my life now. So uh, super unproductive and not fun. Yeah, no, not fun at all. I'm trying to get the, uh, uh, so let's see, uh, uh, Jim uh, is asking in the chat, uh, what's your uh, music genre and instruments? Uh, I was trying to find the link to the uh, uh, to your band camp. Let me get get one of those for you first here. There you go. And uh, Duck Pop dot band camp. That's what I uh, Yeah, and uh, as far as the music that I'm making, um, like everything else I've been talking about, I tend to go whatever directions uh, I'm taking. I usually tend to have kind of a one man band kind of thing, but I've done a couple rap albums. I've done some like ambient circuit tune, uh, circuit pin albums. Uh, I did six chip tune albums and I've kind of like allowed myself to retire from that. Uh, and right now I'm kind of working on uh, beat driven, you know, backgrounds for like, uh, like films and stuff like that. Uh, using, using loops from like mouth harps and fun, weird instruments and kind of pulling them together in, in ways that you wouldn't expect. Hmm. So the thing uh, before we before we do final thoughts here, uh, I I did want to want to point out two things that that was really interesting to me. We've got a an, a, a literal engineer of of uh, a rocket engineer is am I? Yeah, robots. Not so much the rockets. I was jealous of the guys making the rocket engines. Fair enough. A robotic engineer. We've got. We've got your your man about town maker here with with Doc Pop. We've got you know just about anything you can name that can be made. He is made it. We've got ex DJ, a current podcaster guy. Uh, we've got oh here, let me uh, go ahead and and uh, I'll throw that link in the chat here for you. Um, and you know and and we have a woodworker. And what's really what I find that that's really really interesting is that all of us had very very similar similar issues with our respective fields. Because I guess it's just, it's a universal thing that has to do with, with just making in general. Humanity. Yeah. 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 And the other thing too is, is, is you said something blaze that kind of resonated with me. And, and this is something that I kind of sorted out, uh, after the whole DJing thing in the record store and all that stuff just completely blew up in my face. And, and, and it took me probably a good five years to get this into my head, but never regret choices. Well, let me rephrase that you'll always regret choices. So don't sit in the moment and say, oh, well, if I do this, what if I look back and I say, blah, you're gonna, and it doesn't matter. It's okay. Because, because whoever, if, if you zig and you should have zagged, then you're going to be one person 10 years from now. If you zag when you should have zigged, you're going to look back and you're going to be a whole different person. So like, you know, originally what I was going to say is, you know, as far as final thoughts, don't open a record store. But you know that's that's you know that's the easy one, but the uh, but in reality, if I hadn't opened that record store, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. Where I'm at now is pretty nice, you know, making show, you know, doing shows like this, you know, meeting you guys, you know, my 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 house, my wife, everything would be completely different, you know, and I'm glad it's not. So embrace your choices, make your choices, and just go forward from there. Like that's that, that if I could go back and tell myself that at 21, I would have saved myself a lot of heartache because, you know, I, I have a tendency to sit and analyze and, 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 Oh, what if, and blah, 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 blah. No, no, make a choice, make the best choice you can with the information you have and go forward. That's, Use that's your mistakes as networking and getting to know people. It's never a bad thing to know more people and just Absolutely. enjoy each other's company. Yeah. Definitely. All right, doc. I guess we're gonna have to give you the, uh, the, the final word here. What do you, what do you got for us? I mean, I, you're, you're totally right. I, I have had projects go disastrously. I've had successful projects that no one cared about thus a disaster as well. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not doing what I thought I was going to be doing when I was 20 and it turns out it's okay. Everything's good. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of a pretty sweet life. I think 20 year old or 21 year old me would be looking right now and being like, Okay. Yeah, that worked out. Okay. That worked out just fine. Absolutely. Blaze, what about yourself? Okay. We'll, we'll give you five. That was you got... No, that I, was good? I knew it that. that was beautiful. Well, all right. Ah, That'll work then. Excellent. All right. 
So, hey, uh, everybody out there, if you like what you see here, uh, we've got more of that on Mondays and Friday nights uh, at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, of course, this is all on behalf of the Sin Shop, uh, sinshop.org, for more information on that. Uh, you can uh, head over there to, uh, to sinshop.org and, and find out more about the shop. Uh, it is an actual physical place that will be open somewhat soon in the next couple months. We freaking hope if we can get the power stuff good. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, check us out over there and check us out right here, Mondays and Fridays. Uh, I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and we've got Dr. Popular and Blaze with us. And thank you so much for joining our panel.